So uh, the talk is about quantum gravity indeed. Uh, I will uh, uh, not mention uh, much of string theory because I don't work on it, but I, I, I will mention, uh, I will focus rather on some other formalism for quantum gravity, mentioning some string theory on the way, along the way. So the talk is about quantum gravity, and I guess you all have an idea of what the problem of quantum gravity is. So uh, the attempt to complete uh, uh, the current S theory of gravity, which is classical general relativity, pushing it to the quantum domain. The first message uh, to set up a bit uh, the perspective I will adopt in this talk is the first message is that uh, recently the, the perspective on quantum gravity has changed. And uh, uh, a large part of the community do not see, uh, does not see quantum gravity uh, as the result of quantizing our classical theory, uh, general relativity. So you have a classical theory, you apply some quantization algorithm and you get to the quantum version of it and that's quantum gravity. But the perspective has shifted. Now, uh, the, uh, a lot of people see quantum gravity as the problem of constructing a quantum theory of uh, sort of space-time atoms or space-time constituents out to which uh, the usual notion of space-time, geometry, fields, and gravity should emerge in some approximation. Uh, the change may sound subtle, but uh, it's not uh, uh, on a lot of, uh, on, on very many technical aspects. The change in perspective is motivated by several results in semi-classical physics, uh, space-time thermodynamics, uh, the black hole information paradox, many results in ADS-CFT, some insights from analog gravity in condensed matter. And at the same time, uh, it is motivated by many insights from uh, actual quantum gravity formalism that are under development, string theory being one, uh, canonical loop quantum gravity, and, and many others. So these uh, results uh, suggest uh, some fundamental discreteness, uh, maybe a breakdown of locality, maybe some hidden microstructure and the idea of gravity as a sort of a collective phenomenon. Uh, so all these insights are to uh, lesser or greater extent incompatible with the simple idea that you take the gravitational field, uh, the classical one, and you quantize it, you turn it into some uh, operator. The second set of suggestions that are informing a part of the work uh, in the, on quantum gravity recently is the idea that entanglement among these candidate fundamental constituents underlying uh, space, time, and geometry are actually, uh, is actually responsible for uh, the emergence of geometry. And there are a number of results, uh, again, in several contexts, uh, for example, in the context of uh, ADSFT, suggesting that uh, you know, uh, geometric quantities are indirectly just measures of entanglement among the fundamental constituents, which are themselves not uh, directly described in uh, spatial temporal or gravitational uh, ways. So this is the first message. Now we are going to see some uh, concrete examples of uh, these ideas. Um, so the main hypothesis then is to treat, uh, try to treat uh, space-time as a, a peculiar, because it has to be background independent, uh, quantum many-body system. And background independence simply means uh, that uh, this quantum many-body system cannot be defined on some given space-time or geometry. Of course, uh, the idea is just an idea unless you realize it in concrete models. So I'm focusing on uh, uh, a particular formalism for quantum gravity called uh, tensorial group field theory, uh, but it incorporates results and ideas at the mathematical level uh, from a number of other approaches, lattice quantum gravity, canonical quantum gravity, and so on. And in fact, most of what I say in the following applies to all of these uh, related quantum gravity formalisms. So in these models, the candidate atoms of space can be pictured and are mathematically uh, described as quantized tetrahedra, little you know, simplices, abstract uh, simplices decorated with algebraic data encoding their discrete geometry and then quantized, treated at the quantum level. So 
a word of caution. Of course, uh, we are uh, crazy enough to do quantum gravity, but not as crazy as uh, thinking that you know down there there are little uh, uh, tetrahedra floating around. Uh, this intuition is uh, nothing more than indeed the pictorial representation of things. But uh, the moment you picture a tetrahedron floating around, you are in fact picturing something embedded in some space. And that is clearly not what the theory should be about because it's exactly the emergence of that space that we want to explain. At the mathematical level, we can associate uh, to a combinatorial tetrahedron, a Hilbert space of states, uh, and it can, uh, whose quantum data, the quantum variables can be given in purely algebraic manner in terms of uh, um, group theory. So you have to trust me here. This is the result of a lot of work, eh? but uh, the Hilbert space that is convenient to associate to an individual tetrahedron is just an L2 space over uh, four copies of, uh, of a group. Uh, yeah, there are several models, but uh, let me work with SQ2 as the reference group on which we impose an invariance condition under the diagonal action of the group. And there are additional geometricity conditions that uh, have to be implemented at the dynamical level. So when you when you impose some quantum dynamical equation for a tetrahedron or several tetrahedra. So uh, an equivalent, you can uh, draw, you can represent graphically your fundamental atom of space as a tetrahedron or as a node with four outgoing links labeled by the same algebraic data. The it's easy to find a complete basis by expanding uh, in uh, Peter Weil decomposition uh, square integral function over several copies of the group. And you find that a complete basis uh, is given by a so-called spin network function. Uh, in particular, for a single tetrahedron, it's just a node with four outgoing links. Uh, and each link uh, is labeled by a representation of SU2, an irreducible representation, so a spin. The endpoint just by projection angular momentum projection, and the node carries uh, uh, the degrees of freedom about the intertwiner between the four representations following from the invariance condition. So this abstract object is our candidate basic constituent of quantum space. Let me tell you a bit more about uh, this candidate constituents. First of all, you can define uh, operators encoding the discrete geometry of the individual tetrahedron of a single tetrahedron. You can define the area operator associated to a boundary triangle. You can define a volume operator associated to the whole chunk of the tetrahedron. And uh, there are, uh, the spin network basis is in fact the basis of an eigenstates for such uh, geometric quantities. You get uh, as a spectrum uh, with, uh, which is given by some function of the algebraic data the spins and the intertwined degrees of freedom for both operators. Of course, the single tetrahedron is not particularly interesting if you're interested in a, a continuum space uh, and uh, space time and uh, gravity. So let's go in steps. We first uh, define the Hilbert space for several connected tetrahedra. And uh, uh, you can work uh, equally well with the, dual, with the dual graph. So with several nodes uh, connected across links. And again, you have an algebraic characterization of the states, of the quantum states, and uh, a complete basis is again given by sp uh, spin networks. So graphs labeled by representation data. Of course, a single graph, so a single collection of glue tetrahedra is also not enough. So you want to define a, a Hilbert space that uh, includes, uh, allows you to consider a possibly uh, infinite, and in any case, arbitrary number of connected or disconnected tetrahedra. In a class of models that I'm focusing on, uh, this is just a Fox space. You assume bosonic statistics, uh, and you have a Fox space uh, for arbitrary collections of quantized tetrahedra described in such algebraic terms. And correspondingly, you can have a second quantized uh, picture, second quantized representation for the same geometric operators you have in first quantization. For example, the volume operator is a simple functional of uh, uh, the creation and iteration of 
operators, and it just weights the sums the contributions for all the quantum tetrahedra in your generic state uh, and associates to it a total volume. So to each state, uh, you have a notion of a total volume that you can compute. Can I interrupt for a second? So there has been a question yeah. by Alessandro Tiani. Um, what is the dimension of the Hilbert space associated with a single tetrahedron? It's infinite because it's L2 over uh, uh, four copies of SU2. So it's an L2 space. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the point is that in this generic, in this uh, complete Hilbert space, uh, generic states will not correspond to connected uh, simplicial lattices. You have a, uh, equal, uh, you have as well uh, uh, highly degenerate configurations, if you want, from the point of view of any geometry formed by a disconnected tetrahedra. And even when they are connected, then they don't satisfy necessarily any semi-classicality requirement. So even from the point of view of discrete uh, simplicial geometry, you're going to have something that doesn't look very, very much of a standard space. So in this sense, one can speak uh, at this level uh, of a radical disappearance of continuum uh, space-time in geometry. Then, uh, the, this is just the kinematics, this is just the space of states, but you want to be able to define some uh, dynamics uh, and out of which you want to reconstruct some notion of space-time. There are several formulations, again, this is just a survey, a report from the frontier, rather than a, you know, a proper discussion of all the possibilities and details. But uh, in general, you don't have any external time parameter. So uh, the, any operator equation that you try to impose on your quantum states encoding the dynamics will not give you a Schrodinger equation, will just give you some constraint equation. This is the infamous uh, problem of time in quantum gravity, but it's simply the absence of an external time parameter. It's there also in classical general relativity. Uh, a second strategy that people have been following is to uh, define a higher dimensional, four dimensional lattice with boundary formed by the connected tetrahedra corresponding to your uh, boundary states and define some quantum amplitude for such lattice. So you take a, a sort of a lattice uh, gravity or uh, lattice gauge theory, in fact, uh, uh, perspective on the quantum dynamics for such states. Another possibility, and that's what I was referring to as tensorial group field theories, is to simply take advantage of the uh, Fox space second quantized uh, formulation, and uh, you define a field theory for such atoms of space. The peculiarity is that uh, the interaction should describe how these uh, uh, three-dimensional building blocks form four-dimensional cells, and therefore the interactions of the, uh, of the theory are characterized by a peculiar combinatorial non-locality in the way you identify arguments uh, in the fields. And then you have a, well, uh, not really standard, but not too weird uh, field theory, and you have your partition function for the field theory that you can expand in diagrams perturbatively. And those Feynman diagrams will describe uh, uh, four-dimensional lattices, exactly of the type uh, uh, studied in the uh, previously mentioned strategy. You don't have any external time parameter, but you can try to use some internal additional degree of freedom as uh, an internal clock. This is the so-called relational strategy to the problem of time in uh, quantum gravity. With respect to such internal clock, you can in fact define an Hamiltonian evolution for the field theory. Now, before I move on to give you some uh, glimpse of some uh, recent results, uh, I, I, I think I have to uh, uh, give a quick preliminary answer to, to an existential question that many of you will maybe are maybe asking themselves and would like to ask me, which is, uh, wait a second, where is gravity in all that? Now, if the full answer, of course, will have to come from studying the continuum limit and showing that you can reproduce uh, an effective uh, uh, continuum dynamics uh, as that can be expressed in terms of general relativity or some modification of it. 
we want to connect to our best description of gravity. That I will discuss uh, uh, in, in a couple of minutes. At this stage, the connection to gravity is at the discrete level, so just a discrete connection. And uh, at the, it can be seen at several levels, uh, and these are all the reassurances that we are not uh, clearly on the wrong track. Not much more than that, but uh, not too little either. So first of all, independently of such uh, tetrahedra, atoms of space, and so on, you could just take a continuum gravity, continuum general relativity, reformulate it as a gauge theory, and canonically quantize it. This is the so-called uh, canonical loop quantum gravity approach, which is uh, one of the uh, uh, best developed formalism for quantum gravity at the moment. And uh, well, the point is simply that the resulting space of quantum states uh, is indeed associated to graphs uh, and uh, it coincides with the Hilbert space for graph for each graph that I uh, introduced earlier coming from this uh, uh, simplicial tetrahedral perspective. So there is a connection with uh, uh, one other way of studying the quantization of gravity in the continuum uh, that is canonical loop quantum gravity. Another way of trying to do quantum gravity uh, is simply to uh, apply the strategies from uh, uh, the quantization of uh, um, these theories, for example, lattice quantization, quantization on lattice, you can take the classical gravitational theory, discretize it on a lattice, and then try to define the corresponding lattice path integral. Well, the lattice quantum amplitudes that I mentioned in the previous slide for these models are indeed uh, the lattice gravity path integrals that you could independently define um, as a, in a lattice quantization approach. And in fact, the perturbative amplitudes of the field theory formulation of the atoms of space coincide with this lattice path integrals uh, on the lattice dual to the Feynman diagram of the field theory. Last, uh, to make this uh, discrete connection to, other, to, up, to uh, gravity, well, this type of strategy in terms of uh, a field theory generating uh, discrete structures uh, has been already applied successfully in the simplest uh, two-dimensional case, uh, and that is the uh, famous, uh, so uh, famous uh, random matrix models. And these uh, field theories that I introduced uh, for this tetraedra are just the natural combinatorial generalization of that uh, to higher dimensions. So all these connections with other related formalism are just uh, are useful uh, um, um, guidelines for model buildings, and they guide also our physical interpretation of uh, what we do in this context. There has been one more question. Um, yep. So of course, for me as an experimentalist, it's hard to, <laughs> to follow everything. Um, but um, I think the question is like, to what extent the, the whole discussion that you, are, that you are presenting relies on the framework of the tensorial group field theory that you are assuming, like SU2, like why SU2, and like, can you elaborate so, a bit? As I said, uh, w whenever I don't mention explicitly a field theory for the tetraedra, uh, then the, what, I'm, what I say applies to uh, all this related formalism. So all this, uh, the Hilbert space for this tetraedra, the type of data you use and so on are in fact shared by all this uh, related formalism. Of course, the moment I say, well, you, you take uh, some particular field theoretic model and you apply this field theoretic uh, technique, uh, well, then I'm relying on a field theory formulation of the story and that's the tensorial group field theory. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Okay, so uh, the, fir uh, the first thing I want to say is not uh, yet at the level of uh, uh, connection to continuum gravity, but uh, looking a bit more in detail about the microstructure, all these uh, discrete and algebraic uh, uh, objects. I mentioned that uh, you, know, you can consider states associated to several tetrahedra connected to one another. What I didn't say is that uh, Connecting tetrahedra in terms of the quantum states has to do with taking the quantum data associated to the individual tetrahedra 
and um, producing an entangled state um, between them. And the uh, gluing, the establishing of a connection from one tetrahedron to the next is just an entanglement pattern. This can be generalized, it's true for any arbitrary uh, gluing of tetrahedra, so to an arbitrary dual graph. So the uh, graphs that I was mentioning as underlying uh, our quantum states uh, are nothing else than entanglement patterns among the, our quantum objects. In fact, uh, if you're familiar, as uh, I'm sure most of you, uh, many of you are, are uh, with uh, tensor networks, you realize that uh, the type of uh, quantum states that they defined, uh, in particular the basis of quantum states that they defined, uh, can be understood as uh, a, a class of tensor networks, the PEPs. So it's like having tensors uh, for uh, the as a basis of states for each uh, building block, uh, and then gluing them together through um, uh, entanglement through some link state, which will be a definition of a tensor network. Then, because we have invariance at each vertex, so we in fact have invariant tensor networks under some group action on the tensors. The generic states in this formalism are in fact uh, generalized tensor networks. First of all, because they are arbitrary linear combinations of tensor networks. Um, second, because uh, they are random tensor networks with a probability measure given by the dynamics of the models you're considering. They are generalized because of the group invariance. They are generalized because the link dimension, the dimension of the Hilbert space you can associate to which link of your network is uh, uh, itself uh, dynamical and could be anything, doesn't have to be equal for all links. And then it's a bit generalized because we can adopt a second quantized framework in which we create and annihilate the tensors of your tensor networks. And the combinatorial pattern itself, the network, is itself dynamical. This has been used in a, in a number of recent results. But first of all, one can see a, a, a realization of the uh, entanglement geometry correspondence that I mentioned at, uh, at the beginning, but at the discrete level. Uh, and I, I just mentioned it quickly. The connectivity of your discrete space, uh, I already stress, uh, is exactly the entanglement between uh, the uh, vertices or the tetrahedra. The measure of entanglement across a link is proportional to the area of the triangle shared by two tetrahedra. And a measure of entanglement between the four links incident to a vertex is a measure of the volume of the tetrahedron itself. And then the, our field theoretic dynamics is a field theoretic dynamics for tensor networks. And then I, I just flash to results and then I move on because I'm uh, running out of time uh, quickly. Uh, the same states can be seen as uh, bulk boundary maps uh, if you have uh, a graph with open links uh, and you can uh, study the under which conditions the map is isometric, which would be a, a necessary condition for holographic uh, behavior. And you see that is directly related to uh, the entanglement properties of your state. And second, you can realize at the discrete level, the uh, famous Ruta Kanayagi formula for um, um, entropy uh, for uh, the uh, uh, surface uh, in the bulk uh, separating uh, the two regions uh, connected to the two regions on the boundary. And this is uh, all this uh, work that I mentioned here relies heavily, has relied heavily on uh, random tensor network techniques. So it's uh, really an application of this correspondence between quantum gravity states and tensor networks. Now, I move on to the last uh, minute uh, or maybe two minutes of, uh, of the talk. Uh, and I try to show you some results uh, uh, where we stand more or less in this context uh, uh, concerning the question, uh, where is continuum space time? How do I extract it? And what about continuum gravity and general relativity? Can I see the connection to that at least in some corner 
of the theory. Well, in the tensorial group field theory formalism, we have indeed the field theory for such atoms of space. And extracting continuum space-time and geometry amounts to controlling the collective dynamics and the critical behavior of such quantum building blocks. And we need to identify some continuum phase uh, that uh, allows uh, for a spatial temporal geometric interpretation. We are guided in recent work by two hypotheses. One is that the relevant regime to have such translation into geometric uh, general relativistic uh, terms uh, is the hydrodynamics of the system. And we focus in particular on condensate hydrodynamics for such uh, quantum many body system. And the second hypothesis is that indeed we have to look for a condensate phase to see geometry and space time. So we literally look at space time as a sort of a fluid of quantum gravity building blocks. And the simplest approximation is, of course, a mean field uh, uh, Gross Pitesky type approximation in which your relevant dynamical variable is the condensate wave function. Let's take the hypothesis and see where it uh, leads us. So this is what I mean by trying to see the universe as a, as a quantum fluid. So we focus on the mean field. And indeed, uh, one can see that uh, the uh, straightforward analog of a gross pitesky equation for uh, the condensate wave function for such a peculiar quantum many-body system of uh, tetrahedra outside of any space-time uh, can be indeed understood as a, a cosmological equation for a wave function, with this wave function leaving on a domain which can be shown is isomorphic to the space of continuum homogeneous geometries. So exactly the sort of function you would use in quantum cosmology it would be the so-called wave function of the universe, function over the space of possible geometries of the universe. However, it's a nonlinear equation because it's a gross pitesque type hydrodynamic equation. Then what we do is to look at a very special case in which we have a, a suitable internal degree of freedom that can play the role of a clock. We go to uh, consider only isotropic configuration. So the universe that we aim to extract is homogeneous and isotropic. And uh, you see there the corresponding equation for the um, uh, fluid density. Uh, which, of course, is a component of the condensate wave function. Next, uh, we can look at the unobservable, which is the volume observable that I introduced earlier. We compute its expectation value, and we extract uh, a dynamical equation, in fact, two equations for it, uh, which is just a translation of the hydrodynamic equation. So we end up with a complicated equation for the volume of the universe. We can analyze the dynamics of the volume of the universe in different cosmological epochs, because we have such internal clock to give us a proper meaning uh, for the notion of early times, late times. And we find some interesting uh, uh, facts. This is the uh, last slide, by the way, uh, so I'm, I'm done. Uh, if we look first at early times, close to what classically would be the Big Bang, uh, which corresponds, in fact, uh, in this dynamics to very small volumes for the universe, we find that there's no singularity for a large class of states, but there is something like a bounce. So the Big Bang singularity is replaced by a bouncing behavior for the universe, going from a contracting phase to an expanding phase. Then the universe continues to expand, we are at intermediate in cosmological terms, times, large volume of the universe. And we find that the uh, dynamics we extract as a good classical behavior. It matches what will be predicted by general relativity, that is a Friedman evolution. Then we keep asking what happens when the volume keeps growing, and we go at later times. And we find something interesting for uh, some large class of states. Uh, we find uh, uh, an accelerated expansion for the uh, universe uh, with a behavior that uh, mimics very well what is called the uh, phantom dark energy in uh, cosmology. 
And uh, okay, so it's uh, interesting and promising results, uh, but there's of course uh, a lot to do. Uh, we only looked at the volume observable and the simplest type of universe we can uh, uh, look at in cosmology. And, and we also looked from the point of view of the fundamental theory at the simplest regime that is uh, hydrodynamics and mean field hydrodynamics. We have to now start considering quasi particles, uh, the depletion factor and so on and so on. So these are the take home uh, messages. Uh, we have uh, uh, models concrete enough to be studied and interesting enough uh, uh, to be loved. Uh, where space time and in which space time and geometries are emergent notions from discrete atoms of space in which we can see space time geometry and topology coming out of entanglement and where we can where we can test the, the further hypothesis that uh, the universe is something like a condensate or a quantum fluid of such uh, non spatial temporal atoms and we see cosmology cosmological dynamics coming out as the hydrodynamics of the system in all of that they were in fact witnessing and testing at the same time the limits of validity of effective field theory description and intuition okay Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniele, for this.